Hello, I'm George Ogilvy, President and CEO of Arizona Sonora Copper Company. We are building the next copper mine in the United States of America for the energy transition uh, moving forward. Hi, it's uh, Simon Clark, CEO of American Lithium. Um, we are a advanced lithium developer with projects in Nevada, uh, the second largest claystone project behind Thacker Pass and then a very large hard rock asset in uh, in Peru. Um, uh, we also have a, for historic reasons, a large uranium asset, which is obviously more and more topical at this time. It says, uh, Sam, you get your morning coffee in there, I see. Good lads. I, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the timing. I won't take it personally. Um, right, the... Okay, but here's the thing, guys. Um, we, we we're going to talk today about battery metals, thematics, and um, you know, yeah, and how you feel it is moving through the phases. Last year was meant to be the year for battery metals. Didn't kind of work out that way, George. Why was that? Well, I think uh, obviously copper in particular is associated with a very strong economy. It tends to be the bellwether for the economy. Uh, and of course, last year economies around the world were uh, a little bit depressed. And uh, obviously, you know, that affected um, the demand for copper and particularly the copper price. What are the kind of drivers of copper? Again, think of the, some of the audience today will be kind of new to the whole kind of, you know, battery thematic, new to the, the, the metal super cycle as, as a phrase. So what are the kind of drivers for copper? Well, I mean, the world has obviously got aggressive, um, you know, climate goals. Um, there's a drive for decarbonization and move away from fossil fuels. And the world would like to replace that with the ability to electrify, you know, a lot of items. And one of those in particular would be electrical vehicles. So, you know, electrical vehicles have been growing on an annualized basis. Uh, the metals that go into electrical vehicles, you know, compared to an internal combustion engine, there's probably two to three times more copper that actually goes into an electrical vehicle when compared to a combustion engine. And of course, with electrical vehicles growing in sales, that is going to require more copper. I, I would argue, though, that going forward, the batteries are actually going to get more and more efficient, very much like, you know, the computer chip boom of the 80s and 90s. The computer chips got smaller, but they got more powerful. The batteries themselves and going forward are going to get more efficient and smaller. But the real drive for copper is really in the charging stations and the transmission lines. Because at the end of the day, if 50% uh, of the population, let's say in Canada, woke up and had an electrical vehicle and everybody decided that they were going to plug it in, the entire national grid would get taken down in a heartbeat. So, you know, I really think that uh, the drive for copper is really in the electrification of the national grid systems and the westernized world. Right, infrastructure. Okay, for you, Simon, bringing you in, obviously lithium had a heck of a year last year in the sense that it, it came off some, some great highs. Um, is it going to levelize, that's a new word, or normalize uh, itself? Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's got to, Matt. Um, you know, I think being, a, being a, nascent, a nascent metal, it's definitely had its ups and downs. I mean, if you look at the various cycles that we've had, but I think last year was the most pronounced with the price going as high as $85,000 a ton for lithium carbonate equivalent. And then, you know, we moved down and early this year it was as low as, you know, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 a ton. So that's a huge move in a commodity uh, like that. And that, that you, you know, I, I think everyone has the strategic vision um, and you have a lot of strategic players, you know, looking at this area and getting involved in this area. But for mainstream institutional investors, you know, those swings are scary. And I think you saw people say, I'm not going to invest at 85,000 because I don't think it's sustainable. And now, of course, it's, at, you know, it's actually come off the lows. It's probably around about 15,000, but it's still at a point where people are saying, you know, has it hit bottom? Where's it going to end up? Um, and we need to see some kind of sign about this going forward. So, you know, I think to George's point, um, you know, yes, there were probably less EVs sold last year than had been predicted, and, and people just reacted to that top-line number plus the move in the commodities. But 
you know, you still had a 35%, you know, growth year on year. Um, and so the overall trend really hasn't changed. It's just you, you're getting swings within that. And so, you know, for us, it's been a frustrating couple of years because when the price went high, you know, you weren't seeing a lot of institutional investors getting involved. And, you know, as the as the price has come lower, it's it's still not yet at the point where people are getting back involved. But I do believe that we're on the cusp of seeing that change. Okay. So it was a case of great expectations last year. And or, or and I'm sorry to Emily Bronte for this one, but Withering Heights applied. <laughs> um, the, so, I mean, Trish, if, if you look at the copper market, we're at 423 today. Pretty exciting. I mean, very exciting price moves in the last two, three months. You've got a very different set of problems and maybe a different stage of um, evolving compared to Simon's lithium. Um, this year for you looks like what? Are we going to see some price spikes in copper or is it going to be slow, steady, a creative growth? I, th- I think it's going to be, the, there might be a price spike still c- to come before the end of the year. I think the reason for that will be linked to the Federal Reserve and when we see a real interest rate cut. I think the rest of the banks, central banks around the world are going to take the lead from, you know, the grandfather, the US Fed. But generally, when you see an interest rate cut, it means a reduction in the strength of the dollar. And usually commodities that are priced in dollars tend to do actually better at that point in time. So I I would expect maybe a a further price spike uh, before the end of this year when the U.S. Fed cuts interest rates and then we see the European Central Bank and the Bank of England and all of those other banks cutting their interest rates as well. But then going forward, you know, when we start to look at the macro picture, you know, you look at the supply-demand fundamentals for copper. Today, the world uses approximately 32 million tonnes of refined copper on an annual basis. Wood Mac is forecasting that by the end of the decade, that will rise to approximately 40 million tons. So it's a bit of a 20 to 25% increase. And really all of the issues are on the supply side, which are going to constrain, you know, the copper. So in order to see more copper come to the market, we are going to have to see much higher copper prices, well above the $4.23 that we see today to incentivize explorers to go and find new copper to build those big, uh, you know, multi-billion dollar capex mines that are required and to see, you know, internal rate of returns that justify that type of risk and that type of investment. $4.23 a pound of copper is not a high enough incentive price to bring that type of uh, supply to the market in the next decade. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great point, George, that obviously crosses over into lithium as well. Um you know, incentive pricing at fifteen thousand dollars a ton just doesn't work for uh, you know a bunch of a bunch of new mines that need to come on. Uh, and you talk about copper and with with lithium, yes, we're approaching the million tons a year kind of range. But um, you know, most forecasts see by the end of the decade needing three to four times that. And you know, by the time we get to twenty fifty, twelve to fourteen times that. So. The numbers do become huge, and at at the current pricing, you're just not going to get a bunch of new mines built. You, you know, in, in lithium in particular, you're seeing on the spodumene side mines being shuttered in Australia and development being slowed. So it's um it's the same thematic, really. I mean, obviously you're at a different point in the cycle there, but I would submit that I think we'll you know we'll we'll see lithium start to edge up. I think in the second half, and as we move through. The middle of the decade, I think the supply tightens again, and we'll probably get back to that thirty to forty thousand dollars a ton, which is really needed to bring on new mines. Okay, so it's a case of please, sir, I want some more. Um, but it is what? Who kind of controls that kind of that, that those kind of price gains? It, you, you talk about supplying issues, George, potentially because companies want to be incentivized, and I guess some of you are saying the same thing. Um, but it, in in the short term. This kind of price spike, is it just going to be sentiment driven or is it going to be driven by industry 
not being able to kind of get what they want. No, it's being driven by, um, by, by, by industry as well. I mean, obviously, you know, in the last several quarters, you know, we've seen mines in South America suddenly be closed. Uh, you know, 400,000 tons of copper just disappeared on an annual basis from Panama with First Quantum and the Cobra Panama. Anglo-American has reduced their three-year forecast by 200,000 tons of copper. And there's a few other producers that have downgraded their forecast as well. So the supply is just not there. <clears throat> and of course, on the treatment and the refining side with concentrates, you know, China has really expanded their capacity in the last decade. And now suddenly we're seeing historically low treatment and refining charges. That's a sign that there's not enough concentrate on the market to keep those smelters running at full capacity. And when you get a syndicate of smelters coming together and looking at, you know, cutting production from 15 to 20 percent this year, it's telling you that the concentrate supply is just not there. And eventually that will feed through into refined copper and that the refined copper will not be sitting in the warehouses around the world at a time at the end of this year and going into next year when world economies are starting to see the green shoots of a growing GDP. And as we said, copper is a bellwether for GDP. When we see GDP rising in the westernized you know, world, it usually means copper demand is going to go up. And that copper is not going to be sitting there in those warehouses. But we've seen a lot of, sort of movement in price driven by um, inventory levels in China, right? You know, and that's affected the, the, the whole spectrum of the of commodity, commodity battery uh, commodities. Um, do you think that's going to become less and less prevalent as the West kind of gears up this whole infrastructure <laughs> drive? Absolutely, yes. Look, there's no doubt in the last two to three decades, China has really fueled the uh, commodities boom uh, in the world, you know, obviously it's cyclical, but they've they've really, you know, been the engine, the driver to that commodities boom. But what is happening now is China will still play a bigger part with respect to a big part with respect to copper, but I think their share uh, will diminish. I think with the drive in Europe and the westernized world and North America towards green energy, the energy transition, and more and more battery style metals, copper being required, they are going to play a bigger part. And and China will not play as big a part as they have done in the last couple of decades. Although they be important. And what's that mean for you, Simon? Because you've got a very sort of technical metal there in the sense that the Chinese have the expertise or have had the expertise and the West is kind of waking up to to the you know the knowledge that China can affect your ability to make margin if you can't solve these problems technically in the West. So for lithium, what's the outlook ex-China? Yeah, it, no, Matt, I, I think it's the same theme that George is talking about. I mean, obviously, a lot of people have looked at the fall in, China, in lithium last year as somewhat being manipulated by the Chinese. I mean, I mean, whether that's true or not, they certainly inventory a lot of lithium from around the world. I mean, obviously, they are the refiner um, of a 60 to 70% of, of, of all lithium pro- products, so they can really control it and you know some people would look at it and say you know that's really driven the growth of a company like byd for example to overtake tesla they've been effectively incentivized by some of the policies in china that have brought the the price of lithium down so you know i think i think i think there's there's two things there's 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 that side of it which is obviously impacting industry and you're looking at the western auto players and, and, and other end users looking to secure their own supplies and make sure that they, um, you know, that they are, are, are not totally dependent on that and, and getting squeezed out by companies like BYD. And I'm, I'm not sure whether Tesla's first quarter numbers were directly impacted by that, but it certainly seems that competition is really starting to impact them. Um, and then, of course, you have the government side. I mean, George has, has mentioned the the whole perspective of going green, but beyond that, and you know, I think this rears its head as you move towards what looks like the potential for a Trump government. Um, is energy security is a massive theme, and decoupling from that. So I do think that as we move forward, you will see a a Western quote start to get developed for for, for, for lithium, 
And I do think you'll you'll continue to see this drive to, you know, somewhat decouple from um, from China as much as you can. Now, obviously, people talked a really good game a year or two ago on that, and they've had to walk things back in the interim because there is a transition. But I think it's a, a theme that's not going to go away and is probably going to become stronger and stronger. Right. So we've heard, we've heard from George about okay, we, we you know, please, we want some more. You know, we we need higher prices to incentivize us, but. Um, the, the, these kind of moves by governments, move, the political moves, we've seen it in in uranium recently. Of you know that's the, that's a sort of been the sort of the the darling commodity of the last six months or five months. Um, governments tend to invest downstream; they don't tend to help the miners. Not even in in uranium, which is uh, in terms of energy security, is that for things like lithium. Do you do you see any help coming your way my, from from miners, or is it all a case of, well, we need to do these extra not just the, the extractive industries will have to sort themselves out. However, the processing and the, the kind of technical component of it, we may see some government money happening. How, how, how do you think the money flows within lithium for you? Well, I, I you know I mean obviously the Inflation Reduction Act is a big incentive in 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 the US and and obviously there's similar legislation in the EU and and I think as industries mature and those tax incentives become more and more of an, a factor for for, uh, for for local mining I think they will have a have a big impact um, you know I think beyond that certainly in the US you've seen um, you've seen a lot of money coming from the DOE and the DoD um, and you know looking being having a major claystone deposit, the second biggest in the U.S., you know, behind Thacker, you know, obviously for us, seeing Thacker Pass get two point two billion from the DOE, and 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 there's a there's a reason for that in my mind, Matt. I mean, and the reason quite simply is, are you going to um, provide that capital to a pegmatite where what all you're doing is mining and concentrating, and then shipping it to China for refining? Or are you going to give it to projects that, yes, may be more unconventional in a lithium sense, but have the potential to produce a high purity product that can be um, converted to a hydroxide or, or, or a carbonate that can go into a battery on site? So without the need for any of that refining and upgrading. So, you know, I think the DOE's shown its hand in, in funding Thacker and Rhyolite Rich, which is a, another of the claystones. Um, and I think that trend continues. So there is real money. There's real impetus. I, I think the one thing that still lags in the U.S. that we really need is the permitting side. Um, and there's been talk about about that. There's always a that pull. You know, people recognize for the new energy paradigm or whatever you want to call it. We need new new metals, and they all want it to happen. But then, you know, you have a bunch of people who don't like mining. And mining, quite frankly, has had to do a better job of showing that we, you know, we we are cognizant of water. We're cognizant of native rights. We're we're cognizant of of the environment. And I think you know practices have moved. And I think the permitting side of things needs to be streamlined to reflect that, so that these mines are coming on in a few years rather than you know another ten, fifteen years. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Simon. And you know, if I just focus in on Arizona Sonoran here. Obviously, we've got a former producing mine in the heartland of the Arizona Copper Belt. And uh, fortunately, we're all on uh, private land. So we're in a unique and fortunate situation where there's no federal nexus. And it's allowed us to actually acquire our permits in a very quick time, just dealing with the local state uh, regulators and the municipality where we have a very strong uh, social license. So we're very, very fortunate there. And the mine also came with water rights to the year 2070. And there's an abundance of water in the ground that's only permitted for industrial use. So a uh, very unique and fortunate situation. So let, 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 let's kind of move on to the, the company component here. I mean, George, in, in, in a way, you've got a, a simpler metal that you're dealing with here it's compared, compared to lithium. Um, but Big infrastructure requirements, you know, and coming back to in terms of being able to process in North America, you know, North American copper being processed in North America, what, what are the options available to guys like 
you at the moment? Do you expect to see a kind of, you know, maybe a little bit more focus on this from the US government to kind of help with that kind of downstream component? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've already had, uh, Simon alluded to, uh, conversations with the Department of Energy that have declared copper as a critical mineral. Uh, we're going back there at the end of this month now that we've got a pre-feasibility study out with uh, made in reserves and a financial and economic model built from reserves. And we think, you know, although it will be a lengthy process, perhaps over 12 to 18 months, we do believe that we can potentially access you know, low cost of uh, capital loans or government grant through the DOE or maybe even the Department of Defense. The other key thing with this product is that because it's a copper porphyry system and we're going after the oxides and the transitionary secondary sulfide, we have the ability to actually leach that and put it through what's known as a solvent extraction electro winning plant where we actually produce a uh, grade uh, A LME copper cathode that can then be sold directly into the US market, either as copper wire or for copper rods for air conditioners, et cetera, et cetera, copper foil going into the batteries. And as Simon said earlier, to his point, it doesn't have to go offshore to Asia to be you know, further smelted and refined only to be sent back. So strategically, it's a product at the right time for the U.S. domestic market. It's, you know, so it's interesting to me that I've seen a lot of companies that I've been speaking to have either thrived in these difficult you know, um, conditions, that would be, certainly on the equity side, and others have just run out of ideas. So, I mean, for you, George, are you, has it made you sort of stop and think about how you – map out the future of this company in terms of the way, certainly around the economics, because I think money's hard to come by at the moment, really hard to come by. Have you had to change that sort of narrative slightly for the market or even for funders? Or yeah, even, no, you, absolutely. When I came on board with this project three years ago, we, we already had a PEA that was, you know, substantially baked and it went to the market. It was, you know, 28,000 tonnes of cathode production per annum and then 18-year mine life. But the criticism we always received was that the, the level of production was just too small. So as we drilled out the resource and found you know new mineralization and we grew the resource to today, we've actually now got 7.4 billion pounds of contained copper sitting in the ground, making it the sixth largest uh, you know, unmined uh, deposit in the US today. The PFS is now revealing 55,000 tons of cathode production a year and uh, a 21-year mine life, and, and that is going to further grow as well. So we're now at a size and a scale where at least we are able to attract quality investment into the company. But the, the issue I think the whole junior sector has had is that we've been starved of capital you know, the specific funds are, are, are diminishing. The generalists just aren't there. But what is going to happen is very quickly, things are going to turn. The generalists are going to come back in. There's going to be a lot of money coming back into the sector, which is going to be good and bad because it's going to allow certain projects to move forward and get financed. But at the same time, there will be some projects that shouldn't get financed and they do, and then they're going to blow up at some point in time, and the whole industry takes a black eye. And that's the frustrating part of our industry, that it's either feast or famine when it comes to capital investment. I, I'm glad you went there, because I, I, I agree. I kind of like these kind of moments in the market, because kind of the wind blows and some branches fall off, and... It, and, and then life goes on. It's, it was, it's all good. Um, Simon, for you, you've also had to, I, I know we spoke recently, you know, you've had to come at this, the, the funding component differently. You've got, you've got the potential of the spin-off of the uh, uranium element, and you've got a couple of projects that you've got to, in terms of de-risking the, the, from that perspective. So you, your take on the market as was and how you play it going forward? Yeah, it's a, it's a, I mean, lithium. Lithium is fascinating. I mean, it's obviously, in in some respects, more of a science project than a mine. And you know, I don't think any of the brines in South America have hit their nameplate yet. It just shows how complicated it is. And you can look back over the last decade and see these forecasts for what supply is going to come on, 
and it never comes on as they think because it's complicated, it's complex. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think for us, what's interesting is you look at lithium and what is deemed to be conventional in lithium terms is to is to take a pegmatite and, um, and concentrate it or, or, or take a sprogamine and heat it to 10 thousand and fifty degrees and then and then ship it offshore for refining and upgrading and someone else takes you know the vast majority of the margin it's a really strange model or 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 a brine where you have acres and acres of of ponds that you know evaporate for like two years and that's deemed conventional and so i kind of laugh because you look at our projects which are in a lithium context unconventional but we've come about it very much from the perspective of we want projects that are easy to mine, both sit at surface, so the mining's simple, and they're more conventional mining projects. They're sulfuric acid leach projects that produce a high purity product at the end of it that doesn't need to go anywhere. And so now for us, the trick is you have to, in, in these markets, people have gone back to what they is deemed tried and tested, and that's focus on pegmatites and and brines and um you know i think that'll swing back like it was a year or two ago where people were very much looking at clay stones and and uh you know i mean i you know i i don't necessarily agree with everything elon musk said but i think when he said that you know that that the u.s can produce all of the lithium it needs from the clay stones there's a there's a huge amount of lithium there and it's easy typically easy to mine um, and, you know, certainly where we are, we can process it through conventional mining means. And that's what we've been looking to show. And I think at Falchani, you know, it's the third or fourth largest hard rock project globally, getting bigger, very thick deposit, but it's a unique style of mineralization. So again, you have to show, yes, it's a conventional um, a flow sheet, if you like, from a typical mining project. Um, and for us, that's the focus. It's showing that, you know, we can produce these high purity products that don't have to go anywhere. And I think when the market takes note of that, that it'll, it'll position us really well. So, you know, that's where we focus, Matt. As, as you've said, we're, you know, we're fortunate in this market. We've got a large uranium project that, you know, will, you know, assuming we're smart with it, will allow us to, you know, help fund the lithium side as we keep driving forward on a non-diluted basis. Um, so it's nice to have that optionality. I mean, we're not going to give it away and we're, you, you know, we're, we're making sure we have all the pieces in place, but, um, you, and, and, and I think just to finish off, I mean, you look at the last cycle on lithium. I mean, obviously the, the players did, that did well were those that were able to continue to advance things whilst capital was constrained and capital was tight very much to George's point. Now, that's a great point, Simon. I mean, obviously, late last year, Arizona Sonoran announced a $33 million investment from Newton, which is a division of Rio Tinto's copper division. And uh, that was non-dilutive, non-equity. And uh, we got $10 million just for signing the agreement, $12 million to drill out the primary sulfides at the mine site, to try and advance the Newton technology, which isn't in any of our business plans that we put forward, and $11 million towards future land payments, including a property called Mainspring that we now have title to. And, uh, you know, we had to come up with a very unique uh, financing structure, but, you know, just issuing shares at a very low uh, level was going to be highly dilutive to the shareholders of the company. And ultimately, that's what destroys the value in 90% of the juniors is that they're forced to issue shares at highly dilutive levels for $10 million today that in the future is really hundreds of millions of dollars if they make it to production. Yeah, well, like, I, I, I feel remarkably um, buoyed by your conversations about the, the future of ba the battery metal thematic this year. Um, I'm going to, just conscious of time, just going to let you finish off each with maybe give us three or four reasons to believe why uh, investors should be investing in your respective companies. I'll start with you, George. Well, look, as we touched on, I think uh, there is going to be a structural deficit going forward in copper. Uh, incentive prices are going to have to be much higher. 
And for those companies that can develop a copper asset and put it into production, I think uh, that's going to create a lot of value from for the shareholders of the company compared to these low levels that we're at today. Uh, remember with the Cactus Project, it's all on private land. There's no federal nexus. It benefits from existing infrastructure, including roads, power, access to water, a community next door such that we don't have to build a camp. Uh, we're only 70-odd kilometers away from Phoenix with a population of 4.5 million people. We're in Arizona, so from a geopolitical, socioeconomic perspective, it's probably one of the safest jurisdictions to date in the world. Mm. And um, there's a main power line that actually runs right through the property from a nuclear reactor, the Palo Verde nuclear reactor west of Phoenix. So we can even draw 100% green energy from that line. So ultimately, when this goes into production, our greenhouse gas emissions are going to be somewhere between two to three kilograms of CO2 emission per kilogram of copper produced, and that's without any carbon credits. So this will actually be one of the lowest carbon emitters for a copper mine in the entire world. And because we benefit with all of that infrastructure and it's a brownfield site, when we go to build the mine, we're currently showing about $515 million to put this into production, including $70 million of contingency. But when you think about that as a capital intensity per tonne of cathode that we'll actually produce, it's $10,300 a tonne. And that puts it in the lowest quartile when it comes to capital intensity. And we believe that that represents less risk when it comes to the actual financing and eventually the execution of putting the mine into production. So for those reasons, I would say to the listeners and the viewers, if you're looking at copper development stories that are low risk and in very, very safe jurisdictions, Arizona Sonora Copper Company should absolutely be on your list. There you go. That's not, not a bad pitch. Um, <laughs> Simon, uh, I don't know if you can top that, but good luck. Well, Give it a go. You know, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, there's obviously... You know, there's lots of things going for copper, and 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 I would totally agree with George. It's 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 a, it is very much a critical mineral, and I think it's becoming more and more understood as such. So, um, you, you know, I I think for us, Matt, really, it's 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 about you look at the macro. Uh, I mean, we came out with you, you know a, a tripling of our of our nav um, recently at Falchani. You know, project economics now showing five point two billion. Um, it's a huge project. Um, you know, earlier last year we we came out with the initial PA at TLC, and and you know it was a three point three billion nav. So, you know, and then you add in the uranium, we've we're, we're close to ten billion dollars in net asset value, and yet our market value is about two hundred million Canadian. So, I you know I look at that, I I, I think the, the 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 and and George hit on it, the central bank. Definitely, you know, everyone talked about this bull market in equities. I mean, quite honestly, that is bull. <laughs> it was uh, maybe a dozen to twelve um, companies that drove have driven that, and uh, everyone else had a very tough year last year with the risk off. And I, I think that's changing. I think it it would seem more and more that we've hit bottom in the lithium space. So, you know, I think there's incredible value in companies like us. Just looking at the projects, and obviously, you know, like I said, our 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 focus is, you know, keep heads down, keep building pro uh, value at the projects. We're going to get value for that as 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 the sector turns. And in the interim, you know, we've got a, you know, what is the fifth largest undeveloped uranium asset as well, um, which is going to help us drive value. And one of our tricks is going to be to unlock value for our shareholders from that asset as well. So, you know, I think I think our mix of assets is quite unique and and really strong. And, um, you know, I think this is a time where you're going to start to see people coming off the sidelines and, you know, hopefully squeeze all those shorters out there that, that uh, were piling on everyone uh, as we went through last year. And, I, you know, I think the whole sector will um, will – We'll see a strong recovery as we move through the second half of next year. Oh, sorry, of this year. 